Hello everyone and welcome to the second night of the isolation talks. Uh, welcome to wherever you are in the country in your moments of isolation. My name's Adam and uh, I'm here sitting in my office tonight. Thank you for joining us last night. For those of you who did, we had uh, just over 400 people tune in to listen to Angelo and I thought it was a really remarkable talk and I want to thank Angelo particularly for that. It was absolutely sensational. Um, we got some really good feedback. Uh, apologies for any technical problems that happened yesterday. That is completely my problem with trying to learn how to do all of this in two days, given the quantum of people that uh, decided they wanted to uh, log in and have a, have a watch. So the purpose of the talks is a couple of fold. One is to think local, to re-engage in a discussion about Australian architecture and Australian architects and the excellence that exists within this, uh, across this continent. Uh, in that regard, I first of all want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're all sitting, wherever we are across Australia, and indeed if you're sitting anywhere else across the world, to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which you are and pay our respects to their elders. Uh, the second part of it is to think about keeping learning. One of the most, uh, I think, valuable things we can do at this period of time is to uh, take the moment, take the time to, to teach ourselves new things and to learn from new people. And it's also about gaining some excitement from other people's work. So tonight we have um, Vokes and Peters, Aaron and Stuart, who are joining us from Brisbane. So last night in Sydney, tonight Brisbane. Uh, and I wanted to thank them for being here and um, really appreciate you guys giving up your time to um, come and have a chat to us tonight. Thanks, Adam. Good to see you. You too. Thanks, Adam. So, uh, are you, you two are isolated, isolated from each other, I can see. You can tell by the roof trusses. That's really good. I mean, we, we, uh, I was excited about asking you, you guys to come because uh, for me, the, I find your work um, particularly joyful. Uh, there is some, there's kind of moments of just absolute and sheer and utter joy when I'm given the opportunity to come and visit some of your projects. Last time I was in Brisbane, I got the opportunity to visit, I think it was the Tenerife House, and uh, it was just incredibly fantastic to come and have a look at the projects. I think uh, one of the things I, I think about when I think about you guys is that there is a, an absolute commitment to the vocation of architecture. It's not just it's your job, it's like it's your, they're your lives. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, so thanks for coming along. We really appreciate it. Um, Aaron, perhaps you could share your screen and we could um, we get that started so I'm not waxing lyrical for too long. <laughs> but um, yeah, this this talk, as I understand, is a talk that you gave um, previously um, at UTS about 12 months ago, and we've kind of recaptured it for tonight. Um, so thanks for that. I know it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to put these things together. Um, we'll talk. We'll have you talking for about. Uh, I think about 45 minutes, um, and then we will uh, cut back to have some questions. So um, we're really without further ado, Aaron, I'm gonna pass this to you. Thanks, Adam. Um, <clears throat> we might wanna do a little bit better than that. The practice went at around about 35 minutes, so um, we'll try and keep it short and sweet. We've, we've got a plan for tonight, and the plan is that um, the original lecture I presented solo, uh, so, uh, so I'm going to present, present um, the, the, the lecture itself solo again, again. Um, but, but once, once we get to the end of the lecture, lecture I'm going to try and back out and uh, uh, Stu will come in and answer, answer questions, questions predominantly. Uh, <clears throat> we, I know there were some IT problems last night. Um, we've got our, got our IT support on hand. Um, I've, uh, that's, that's me, me um, flicking a wine glass on my finger. That's, that's our IT support. support. So um, we've got, got, got an absolutely foolproof um, system in place. The, the, lecture, the lecture itself uh, was given um, at the end of last year, I think in September maybe, uh, at UTS. So apologies to any UTS students that were in the room that um, have tuned in tonight, hoping for something a little bit novel. Um, it was presented as part of uh, the Australian, Australian domestic, domestic lecture, lecture series um, that, that Guillermo was, was running, running and as a result, it's um, 
it's predominantly uh, residential. In fact, it's it's exclusively residential. Um, <clears throat> we'll be presenting four projects and eight ideas uh, related to those projects. It's also, um, given that it was originally a student presentation, I apologise, it's quite undeniably didactic in tone. Um, I hope that you'll forgive us for that. So um, I, I'm presuming, I know Adam will be on mute, but I'm presuming that someone would have told me if you can't see the screen right now. And I'm also presuming that you can't see me. So. Aaron, it's all good. The, uh, we can't see you. We can yep. see your screen. There's a bit of echo going on. So if um, if someone hasn't muted, that would be excellent. But uh, if they could, but if you if you have muted, that would be great. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, that's you, Stuart. Try and stop yelling into the computer. I've been told that I'm doing the old man thing of yelling into the computer. So if I speak a little softer, that might help. Um, so yes, as I said, four projects tonight and eight ideas. And at the very end, um, as an added bonus, we have a little bit of product placement, um, which I'll try and remember to, to include on running order. Um, the first project, our moral house. So this house is located at the top of a hill. Um, the limb is about six kilometres from the centre of the CBD in Brisbane. You can see just a little slither of the Brisbane River um, at the top of the picture there. And if I click to the next slide, you can see our project site down the bottom there, um, circled in pink. And the, the house um, site backs onto a really steep gully. You can see there's a pocket of bushland and probably about 20 other houses that are all backing onto the same gully. So it's uh, really um, quite exquisitely beautiful at the back in places, but it's also really heavily overlooked by some of the neighbours. And you can see that in the slide on the right-hand side. Uh, when we were approached to get involved in the, the project, it was quite a long time ago now. It was about 2005, I think, that we started the project. And it was being occupied at that time as a share house. And you can see in the middle um, slide there the kind of condition of what the interior was like. And what had been done to the house um, was a, a lot of the kind of peripheral spaces like verandas have been turned into sleep out. And you can see from this plan, which is the existing plan of the house, and hopefully you can see the cursor coming across the screen there, a lot of those spaces were turned into bedrooms. So you found that the front veranda was a bedroom, front room of the house had been turned into a bedroom and then the sleep out enclosed adjacent to make a little study. And <clears throat> the public and private rooms of the house are sort of spread all over. Um, so you get uh, living and dining on this side and then a kitchen and, I'm oh, sorry, dining over here. So it was a little bit of a mess. Um, and probably the, the biggest problem with it was that it was very introverted. Um, because of the way in which the, the plan had been filled in over time. So we started sketching away. Um, and really what we were seeking was some kind of clarity initially in the plan. I, I think we, we made a small addition to the back of the building, which you can see here, but mostly uh, the project was about trying to reconfigure the existing floor plan to get it working a little more coherently. And this is a plan that we came up with so the, the entry is still made um, onto the front veranda, but that veranda is now opened up again. The kitchen moves into the front room. You get two living spaces, a library and a dining room. And <clears throat> probably most significantly, all of the private areas of the house, um, the wet areas and the bedrooms are aligned along the southern side of, of um, the main corridor. And at the back, as I mentioned, a new extension, which includes uh, a garden room, um, Stu's uh, referring to it as, an outdoor staircase that takes you down to the garden and to the undercroft of the house, and a new bathhouse that you have to go outside through the outdoor stair to get to. And here's a cross section. So you can see the existing floor plan of the house, the undercroft, and this really quite um, precipitous fall away to the back of the boundary um, and a new pool lurking down here at the bottom. So the first story. <clears throat> so back in 2005, most of our projects tended to start with a kind of typical scrappy brief, um, one that consisted of a few room names, um, maybe a not to scale plan sketch, um, some photos. More recently, you get the uh, link to the Pinterest board. It's all kind of fairly straightforward. 
Um, but in this instance, um, Stu decided to ask our clients to prepare some short stories about how they live and have lived and would like to live in the house. And it was kind of a fairly obvious leap because um, one of our clients, John Birmingham, is an author and a journalist. Um, some of you might know of his work. And what we received back from them was really beautiful, incredibly evocative and very insightful. So Jane wrote, I like to think I can garden and usually escape the family on the pretext that the garden needs some attention. One of my favourite childhood books was The Secret Garden, and I love the idea of there being different rooms within the gardens that you can enter and hide in. So reading this helped us resolve the relationship between the suspended living levels um, and the steep garden below. Suddenly we were mas making a hidden garden at the bottom of the outdoor stair, a garden that you entered by popping out of a tiny door at the bottom of a massive weatherboard escarpment. Jane says, I like to sit with my cup of tea in a quiet spot above or next to the garden and identify each plant and get a little bit excited when a particular plant or tree has its turn to show off. So we buried the outdoor stair in the facade and made a giant opening with a sill at elbow leaning height, wide enough to rest a mug on. John says, the first place I felt truly at home was a big table in the corner of the main reading room in the Mitchell Library at Sydney. It was it was huge, it was quiet, it was sort of cut off from the rest of the floor while still giving me a view of the reading room. It let me spread my crap everywhere. I used to write for a few hours, pop out onto the sandstone forecourt for a coffee, then come back and write some more. The problem I've always had from working at home is that there's no sense of going to a special place. My current office is a thoroughfare between the bedroom and the main hallway. I can hear everything going on about me while I work. And when I'm on late night deadlines, I feel like I have to tap the keys extra lightly so I don't wake everyone. So we put his studio under the house with a private window into the garden. And we also made sure that he had to go outside by the outdoor stair to get there, a daily commute to his home office. The narrative brief taught us <clears throat> that room names are really inadequate when it comes to describing space. What actually plays out in the living room could be anything from watching the kids roll their drawings out on the rug to a drunken party with guests swinging from the chandeliers. The narrative brief taught us that we needed to find a better way of understanding our clients to help us look beyond the real estate naming conventions. A house is capable of embodying all the nuance and complexity of the city in microcosm, but if we insist on seeing it in terms of a commodity, a status symbol, or a lesser architectural undertaking, we just count the possibility of it ever realising its potential. Oi. Pardon me. Sneak preview for all of you. Bloody IT. All right, um, story number two, the public nature of private buildings. So John writes, I'm trying to only think happy thoughts about coming back to Brisbane. And one of those thoughts is that we have a lot of family and friends there that we don't have anywhere else. I very much want to get back to a tradition of hosting big family friendly feeds every couple of weeks. And Jane adds, I'm one of six kids, so family get togethers tend to be very large. We all like to cook and tend to meet for meals. We all tend to eat outside wherever possible, probably because there are so many of us. We're often found dragging tables and chairs outside to eat. So while much of the styling and form making of this project was happening at the rear of the building, Perhaps the most enduring design decision um, that we made was actually at the front. We reinstated the old verandas and put the new kitchen in the front room. The result was that meals happen on the edge of the street and the routine of domestic ritual animates the frontage. A friendly wave to a morning dog walker becomes a cup of tea, becomes a building block of community. It was really a reminder of two things. The first, that a building, um, the existing building could and often should be the centre of the life and energy of the house, not just the new works. But secondly, that even a private house has capacity to make a meaningful contribution to the city. And I wanted to share this map. Some of you will have seen it before if you've come to a talk that we've given. We use it quite a lot. It was um, last updated a couple of years ago, I think, and the pink dots represent, it's, a, it's an aerial photo of Brisbane, and the pink dots represent built projects that we've completed over the last, um, what, 10 or 15 years. 
And the green dots are projects that could be anything from um, something that stopped at the end of the tender period through to just preparing a fee proposal and having a cup of tea in, in someone's kitchen with them and chatting about their project. And really what this map says to us is that despite the fact that we're running a small practice and um, we, we don't um, make particularly huge buildings, over a long period of time, if we make a sustained contribution to trying to improve the city, we can have an impact on Brisbane, which is equivalent to maybe that of a major cultural building. So if you rolled all of these tiny little projects, back decks and bathrooms and house extensions into one building, you might have um, a space or a place that touches as many lives um, in a day as a cultural centre or a stadium. Project number two, West End Cottage. So this uh, project is located down near the river in West End um, in a low-lying flood plain. Um, and it's flanked on one side by uh, a brick um, eight-pack unit block. And on the other side, a timber cottage. It, uh, there's a site there um, in pink. And you can see these are the, the photos of the building. Um, before the project started. You can see the eight pack on one side and the timber cottage on the other. And at the rear, um, what was a fairly um, large uh, south facing backyard. This is the floor plan of the building. It's a really classic um, Brisbane workers cottage. So you get um, a cell cellular arrangement of four rooms, kind of half a corridor. This one's kind of a step up on the house that my wife and I own, which has four rooms but no corridor. So this is kind of the duck's nuts in terms of workers' cottages. It's got a um, little front veranda on the front there, and then there had been a small addition made at the back, which um, housed the original bathroom, then a little stair that takes you back out into the garden. So we got to sketching. Um, the, the kind of crux of the brief was to add more sleeping accommodation for the family in a second bathroom. So um, I think they had four small boys um, to fit on the site. So that was quite a lot of program on a relatively by Brisbane standard small um, lot. And a lot of our initial sketching was trying to figure out a way that we could preserve open space and a feeling of spatial generosity. And what they ended up manifesting in was a number of studies that looked at introducing a courtyard or a terrace that could act as a light well um, and a kind of lung at the centre of the plan. This is the, the final plan of the building. So you can see the existing cottage at the front here with the veranda retained, the original little corridor, and on the uh, eastern side of the building, you get a suite of public rooms. So a sitting room, a dining room, and a kitchen. And down the western side, you get a master bedroom suite, a TV room, um, we can crash on a big comfy couch, a terrace here, right in the centre of the plan, and then a corridor which snakes around the terrace past um, a string of wet areas and a laundry, and then um, two shared bedrooms which um, open up off that corridor. Cross section through the building. So I mentioned at the start that the site is floodable, and it is. Um, the front house was already raised and we use that for storage and car accommodation, but there was a minimum habitable um, living level for the building and that was about a metre above the garden. So the new works had to be raised about above the ground level. And um, that was a particular concern for us and, and, and for our client because with um, <clears throat> a whole tribe of little um, boys who want to get out and um, knock things over and break stuff, it was really important that they were able to get out into the garden as easily as possible. So that became a kind of driving strategy of um, the sectional diagram. Story number three, manner and detail. <clears throat> so over the years, measured and drawn hundreds of these types of buildings. It's yielded a repository of drawings and photographs. <clears throat> and over time, this language of rude carpentry has found its way into our work. Um, so we find ourselves replicating um, hand-painted timber cabinetry, using battens and braces and arch motifs, um, making lapped connections um, instead of flush joints, and trying to express um, the thickness of material by having thin leading edges that you might be able to grab between your thumb and forefinger. Um, we're also, um, as part of this kind of study of Brisbane and 
um, the vernacular language of Brisbane, found ourselves to get um, <clears throat> quite interested in a, an alternative tradition in Brisbane that's probably a little less celebrated, but that is um, a masonry tradition. So that, that tradition helps us find an architectural response to the problem of grounding buildings in the garden. Um, and of uniting external and internal spaces. And it also teaches us how to work with brick, steel and concrete. So you can see some examples on the screen here. Um, <clears throat> and you can also see how that starts to feed into um, some of the details and materiality of our buildings in this slide. Um, at Western Cottage, our client had specifically approached us for this reason. And as a result, we set about preserving and enhancing the existing timber fabric. Um, we kept the original cellular room arrangements. We didn't try and blow it all open. Um, we preserved as much as possible the single skin VJ walls, the belt rails, um, and made new interventions in the cottage that were designed to sit within this vernacular tradition. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the cabinetry wasn't made as traditional casework. It was made more like a carpentry item and hand painted. On the exterior of the building, we overcame some of the flooding issues by uh, drawing the ground plane up towards living levels uh, by using a masonry base. So a brick terrace at the centre of the building folds into a broad stair and acts like a giant piece of garden furniture where sticky kids can sit and eat an ice block. Um, and in the wall of the terrace, we were able to um, register the passage of light and shadow by turning some of the bricks in the wall and also make a place where you can burn some wood um, to nourish the soul. Story number four, the building is backdrop. So our client was interested in use, using uh, social media and blogging, and she'd been chronicling this process long before we ever got involved um, with the project. And I don't know that we made a deliberate attempt to respond to this, but I do think in retrospect that it started to kind of infuse our thinking when we were approaching the design. And I think one of the ways in which this became manifest was in um, the way that we composed three distinct elevations for the building, each with a distinctive material and graphic quality. So you can see them here. So the first image on the left-hand side is um, a classic Queenslander from the street. The second, a courtyard um, in the centre of the building, which created a second north facing elevation, which we used to catch light and store warmth, um, and also to have the fireplace as a symbolic centre of the house. And then at the rear, we made a little black monopoly house to emphasise the naive graphic quality of the kids' accommodation. Um, and it was also given a little shop window so that the kids could display their wares um, to the backyard. And we also played around with the brick base and introduced this. Um, third folly stair element which just tried to kind of undermine the utilitarian nature of the brick stairs and kind of make it seem more compositional and ambiguous a little more en enigmatic so as I, as I mentioned the client had a blog um, and a social media presence and, and um, later on um, a couple of years after they moved in they moved um, down to northern new south wales for a tree change and converted the house into a, um, a b and b uh, rental property and it's been really interesting to see how this kind of gave a boost to the social media presence of the house um, and also interesting to see how by reaching a broader audience how different entities sort to align themselves with the building so we've had um, the you know the, the photo shoots happening at the house um, had a couple of weddings happening at the house and um, of course, a number of blogs that have picked up the building visits from photographers that didn't involve us that we weren't aware of. And in some ways that's kind of um, challenging because we're used to um, our clients having a much more kind of private um, life and, and really we're the ones making the intrusions. But in some ways, um, West End Cottage kind of had a life of its own beyond us, which has been, been really interesting to see, including uh, um, some of the unfiltered content that we get below the line. And um, I'll try and um, use my best reading voice, but I thought I might highlight a couple of my favorites. So it starts with, love it, but the front stoop needs a railing. People would get sued in the US, cry laughing emoji. Should note that a lot of the um, North American um, followers seem to confuse the rear elevation for the front elevation. Um, ha ha, so true. Looks like a doghouse from the outside, an impressed emoji. Cute, but we would add a handrail and a hefty trim around the window. How about black? 
stone wood and red brick. I would paint the bricks a different colour. The rest is out of this world. Just need a couple of planters for curb appeal, slightly chuffed emoji. The only thing I would add is a handrail, up the front steps and a porch. All misconfigured. The front window is too small. Maybe something to go up to the roof by because it's a little plain. Maybe a fake window or a dramatic statement piece. Hardly any windows makes me think it's a death trap. Great photo, amazing property. Like the location and stuff. Feel free to check out Provolator profile to discover incredible luxury homes in the Dominican Republic. I would have put a porch on the front. Like the style, but we're totally full without a railing. Do you have plans for this house? I'd like to do something very similar. So what does all this mean? It was genuinely really fun to go on this journey and really gratifying to receive all the attention that the project um, did receive. But it's also true that social media is a powerful tool um, for marketing your work um, to potential clients. It can help you connect with other architects and it gives you a platform to present your ideas. But it's also largely a vapid and vacant echo chamber. So if you design your buildings to get likes, you probably won't end up making very significant work. So my advice would be, use it, value it for what it's good for, and otherwise ignore it as much as you possibly can. Project number three, Wilson Garden Room. So uh, these clients approached us, um, they've been living in the um, inner inner city of New Farm in a Donovan Hill designed apartment building, which they absolutely loved. And they absolutely loved the, the uh, suburb that they were living in, but they'd had um, two kids, in that apartment and one of um, the major complications that that caused was that in order to get down to the communal garden they had to come down three flights of steps and that precipitated them um, buying the old um, family house of one of our clients and um, moving to, to Wilston which again I think is about four or five k's from the centre of the CBD. You can see the site um, there in the centre top circle so it's a pretty kind of um, classic inner Brisbane suburban condition. And the house itself um, is on grade at the front, uh, but at the rear of the side, as you can see on the, um, the, the right-hand side image, the ground falls to around about a story below the house. So they were moving from um, an apartment that was um, three stories above uh, the garden to a house that was one story above the garden, but it was still something that we're all quite concerned about um, trying to deal with. And one of the major problems with the house um, as it stood before we got involved was that the old um, rear veranda had been enclosed and turned into a bathroom, which you can see in this image here, which had kind of resulted in it effectively being completely cut off um, from any visual um, connection to the backyard. So this is the floor plan of the building um, at the very outset of the project. So I've got veranda here and um, living areas on the western side. Uh, two bedrooms on the eastern side. So the living areas are really dark. Uh, this is the bathroom on the back veranda that I spoke about before, a kitchen tucked in here, a stair that gives you access down into the garden, and then a little extension that had been built um, onto the rear of the house in, I think, about the 60s, um, which housed another bedroom. So we start sketching away, and while a lot of our projects are solved, I think, in plan, we kind of begin by massaging the plan again and again until we can get something that we can kind of grasp onto. In this instance, the, the solution to the problem or the, the moment that we got confidence that we had the solution to the problem came in this little thumbnail sketch right here in the middle. And that was to look at the bathroom and to essentially demolish the floor of the bathroom and to lower it so that that floor sat halfway between the raised living levels of the house and the garden, a kind of oversized occupiable landing. Here's the floor plan. So you come in to the original front door and we've established a new corridor with the bedrooms flipping to the western side, a um, pair of bathrooms and then the master bedroom at the back here. Um, and then on the eastern side of the building, we've aligned a suite of um, what you might call public rooms. So a living room, a kitchen, and then a new garden room overlooking the backyard, which can draw um, northeastern light into the building and starts to open up um, the living areas to the backyard. Here's that cross section, the original thumbnail sketch um, in CAD. 
story number five, a room overlooking a garden. So I first encountered this uncaptioned image in a compendium of Islamic architecture when I was living in London. And what I really loved about the image was that it compels exploration. For me, it invites the imagination to complete the scene. Openings and stairs are suggestive of movement, but the route is fractured and hidden. How would you enter the courtyard? Is it via the dark passage? Um, then do you enter out via the archway um, at the bottom into the light? And how do you reach the loggia? Is it via a tall, narrow stairwell that takes you up to the rear of the loggia and then allows you to emerge into the room, reoriented back towards the garden that you just departed? What lies behind the facade? Is there a society of unseen rooms gathered around the loggia and the courtyard? Another um, observation that I've made as I've reflected on this, this single image is that the image is um, of the room can be viewed al almost in plan. And for me, this is suggestive of a level of detachment, which is almost like being perched in an opera stall as opposed to being a protagonist in the scene. The room is an empty stage filled with furniture which is suggestive of occupation even when it's vacant. It's anticipating human action. I love the sense of latent possibility that this photograph contains. I subsequently discovered uh, a guidebook to the Guy Anderson Museum in Cairo and um, realised that the picture was an image of its central courtyard. And I've subsequently learned that it um, also appears in an Indiana Jones and possibly a Bond movie. The accompanying plans and photograph confirms many of my assumptions um, about that image, but in some ways it added very little to my first reading of the building. The power of the architecture was in what it suggested as much as what it actually delivered. Story number six, a room overlooking a backyard. So some years later I found myself making a room overlooking a backyard and my mind began to wander back to a picture of a room overlooking a courtyard. The first thing that we extrapolated from the Guy Anderson was to choreograph a journey through the building. The choreography commences from the moment that you arrive. A view of the backyard is visible through the front window of the house. It just as quickly is taken away as you enter the front door. It's not until you step back into the suite of public rooms on the northeastern side of the house that it reappears. And <clears throat> at this point, the brass pendant lights are really significant. They hang in the void to announce the presence of an as yet unseen occupation just below eyeline. As you move towards the rear of the house, the lowered floor allows the angle of the outlook to extend down into the backyard. Like Guy Anderson, the garden room can be viewed in plan. The viewer isn't directly invited into the scene playing out below. Rather than directly entering the garden room, you're forced to turn and circle the space. As you move, the outlook shifts through the windows. Oblique views open up across the space and the viewer is able to look back to the kitchen that they've just departed. Entry into the garden room itself is via a short flight of stairs at the far side of the room. At the point of arrival, the orientation of the viewer is turned around and reoriented back towards the street. Looking out through the street to the street trees through the same window that first offered a glimpse of the backyard. The rear wall of the building is a giant bifold door that can slide away to open the room to the outside. The stair that gives access to the garden is an overscaled one to serve as a piece of garden furniture. The second borrowed theme of the project was that of nesting rooms. The kitchen and kids' bathrooms are gathered around the garden room so that the daily room uh, routine of the family is centred on the space. Bathing children and cooking dinner are conceived as social occasions that bring the family together. The change in floor level prevents utilitarian spaces from encroaching on the garden room and enables multiple events to happen in parallel. Third theme of the project um, was the use of material and craft to underscore the significance of the garden room. The room is lined in painted boards whose joints open up and change with the change in the seasons. At times the boards are removed to reveal the rhythm of the stud frame and spent behind them. Shelves and exposed ledges and dowel pegs encourage the family to occupy and embellish the space with their belongings. And the timber walls are painted a soft hue, setting it apart from other rooms. A not so subtle reminder that the green tinted room is of the garden. So the fourth and final project for this evening is um, the Subiaco House. 
it's uh, a house that's located on a corner site that had been vacant for many years. Um, this is an aerial photograph of Subiaco, um, beautiful leafy historic suburb in Perth. Um, five hours um, plane ride across to the other country, so other side of the country from where we are. And here's our site down here on the vacant lot. Um, <clears throat> as I said, um, the, the site had been, had been a lawn and vacant. And when we started designing the house, I think that the memory of this vacant space and the amenity that it had offered to the community seemed to linger in our thinking. So the initial sketches that we've put together um, continue to show the garden, but at the rear of the house initially tucked in behind the building. And by the time the design of the house had solidified, we'd arrived at a scheme that placed the courtyard on the corner maintaining the oblique views across the site and offering the garden to the street. So here's the floor plan of um, the final project. You can see here we have um, that courtyard garden that I mentioned and um, the other rooms that wrap around it are a kitchen and scullery area, a dining room, uh, a living room back here, a stair going up to the upper level and then a master bedroom suite here with a bay window that looks out to the street. And the courtyard itself is wrapped on three sides with a colonnade and on this um, side of the colonnade the, it thickens and becomes occupiable so there's a bench seat with some solid shutters um, that people can come out and occupy and a fireplace um, to encourage them out to do so and then the upper level of the house is um, a sweet series of kids bedrooms and a bathroom um, <clears throat> and uh, a kids rumpus and living area up here section of the building, the, uh, the heritage um, restrictions that were placed over the site um, as part of the city plan required that the second storey present as an occupied roof space. So <clears throat> um, you'll see in some of the subsequent photos how that is made manifest. Um, but you can also see here the way in which the interior um, spills out into the courtyard and then the colonnade um, which occupies the edge of the street and Here's the footpath and some of these really magnificent street trees um, that surround the building. So story number seven, go west. Our first project in Perth was a house of Stu's sister. And if I'm honest, I, th I think we thought that would be the end of it. But somehow we've been able to attract a number of projects um, in the city, some of which have been built. Um, and I have to say that that's been really welcome and incredibly delightful to, to be able to work in a different context. But it does beg the question of how Vox and Peters should approach designing buildings in a city on the opposite side of the country. The answer that we've found um, is to start in the same way that we would design a building in Brisbane or anywhere else for that matter. And that is by applying the same principles that we've always valued. So valuing open space, celebrating the presence of nature and um, seeing ourselves as custodians of the city. We've also asked ourselves the same questions that we asked when we first began working in Queensland all those years ago. And um, really what that amounts to is um, to try and find what's remarkable about the place. And what's immediately obvious is that the historic suburbs that we're working in are really special. Um, Perth has a rich masonry tradition, exquisite flora, and magnificent street trees that are able to grow to a really impressive scale due to the fact that power lines in Perth are buried, unlike Brisbane. Um, there's also a pool of local trade skill and a way of making that is distinctly different from Brisbane. Um, working in masonry and concrete is far more commonplace and is comparatively economical compared to our predominantly timber built city. So we embrace these things. We make a building using materials that adopt familiar forms and materials but that are rendered subtly contemporary. We explore a planning diagram that is somewhat subversive, perhaps even a little radical in the context of Subiaco. A building that actively engages the street, but opens itself to the garden and offers a space to the public realm. And in doing so, this house also encourages its occupants to participate in the life of the street. Enjoy the beauty of the historic streetscape and the established street planting. And we also permitted ourselves the ability to work in concrete, brick and terracotta shingle to embrace the local vernacular and trade skill. Story number eight, last one, practicing from a position. 
So the final project um, is about Subiaco, but it's really about all of the projects, I think. And it's also about understanding how culture and values make buildings. This talk has tried to focus less on the what of what it is that we're doing and more on the why. That is the values that underpin our approach to practicing architecture. The narrative brief um, was about learning to listen and communicate complex ideas to our clients and them to us. The public nature of private buildings is about accepting that we have a contribution to make to the city and a responsibility to the community. Manner and detail is about valuing historic fabric. Building as backdrop is a reminder not to get caught up in the things that don't really matter and don't make buildings better. A room overlooking a garden and a room overlooking a backyard are an affirmation of our belief that habitat theory and our of our belief in habitat theory and our conviction that an unfashionable and sometimes it's uncomplicated idea can have an enduring relevance that shouldn't be overlooked. Go West is a reminder that in any context in which we're working, um, we should find it rich enough to inspire meaningful pieces of architecture. So what does it mean to practice from a position and why might this matter more than looking at pictures on Arc Daily? I'll try and state my case. When we started our practice, we asked ourselves lots of questions, little ones like, is it okay to leave timber unpainted? And what kind of a wall oven should we pick? And big questions like, who are we? What has value? And what kind of ideas are valid? So, who are Oaks and Peters? And what kind of an idea are we? Number one, Brisbane matters. If we're gonna practice in Brisbane and we ought to embrace it, this means searching for inspiration in a place that we practice seeing Brisbane or any place that we happen to make work as a legitimate place to practice architecture. Number two, our work matters. We need to value the work that we do. We're custodians of the city and our buildings have a responsibility to make a garden, a street, a neighbourhood, a locale, a city better than we found it. Three, people matter. We want to work with ideas that are universal, accessible and capable of resonating with the greatest number of people possible. We're not afraid of ideas that are old and unfashionable so long as they work. Phenomenology, habitat theory, collective memory and narrative, comfort, conviviality, whimsy, context, whether it be historical, physical, cultural or economic. If you need to have an advanced degree to appreciate what we're doing, then we're probably doing it wrong. Number four, we matter. We're part of the community. We teach, we talk, we invite others to share in our practice. We have lives outside of architecture. We have families, we have hobbies, not anti pet, we just don't own any. We need to keep it real. Louis Kahn was a great architect um, and a fabulous mentor um, and inspiration to us, but he never saw his family Cabuzier was a misogynist and apparently an asshole, and a number of extremely famous and widely celebrated practices around the world offer unpaid internships with no holidays or weekends. We're not great architects. But we can play with our kids. So, if you want to make meaningful buildings, first ask, who are you? Where are you? What do you value and why? I hope that helps. Thanks very much. Um, I promised Adam that when I reached the end, which I have, um, that I would let him know um, so that we could follow the protocol for um, sharing the screen. But I should mention that um, uh, I have that little um, added extra um, of product placement. I'm conscious that at the end of Angelo's talk last night that he was able to spruik his book, um, which is on sale at the bookshop. And um, I'd encourage you to get your hands on it because it is um, extremely beautiful. Um, uh, but, but we don't unfortunately have a book and we're not likely to have one anytime soon. So um, hopefully I can follow the correct protocol, but I'll just need to um, flick up a little video or Adam, perhaps you might like to flick it up yourself. Um, um, is that, I is that can't possible? flick it up, Aaron, but I think... Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll have a crack then. You have a crack at that and I'll have a... Um, I've transitioned across myself. I want to say thank you. There's been amazing... Um, chats coming through throughout the entire talk, uh, talking about your work. Um, so we really appreciate the time and effort. And I think at the, at the highest, we had about 480 people watching at once. So that was pretty amazing. Wow. 
Okay. Um, do you want to play the video now, now or would you like me to ask you a question? Yeah, I'll, I'll open it up right now. Um, just a quick intro to say that the, um, the, the as well, we don't have a book. What we do have in, is some cycling kit. And um, I haven't flagged this with Adam, but um, I'm going to say that it's on offer at the bookshop, <laughs> um, despite the fact that it isn't. But if he does get enough um, <laughs> email requests, I'm sure we can find a way to source some of it for you. Um, uh, if Gavin Bannerman is with us, um, you need to um, put your money where your mouth is. Um, but without further ado, I'll try and get this video up. So Adam, shout out if it's not working. And yeah. just brace yourself because there is some audio associated with it. And I'm hoping that it's not going to kind of jump to the next level and shock the pants of everyone. Yeah. Um, hitting, hitting open now. Let's see, this, is, this is our first time trying a video, so let's see if it works. Coming through at your end, Aaron. It's not coming through at ours. No, not working here. Not working. Oh. How, about, how about we go to some questions and maybe uh, we could put the video up on the website. The actual uh, hang on, website. hang on, hang on. How's I'm going to try and kill it. Oh no, that's so tragic. <laughs> I worked so hard on that. We'll put um, it on the you didn't have approval for that anyway, Aaron. We'll, we'll put it up. Did on the you, oh, you could see it, Stuart. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Um, no, I couldn't. Thank God. It's not. It's not overly flattering. It's not overly flattering for Stu. So I thought he might have been lying about whether he could see it or not. Um, <clears throat> well, we'll we'll find a way. We'll find a way to get that out there. Um, so just a couple of questions. I think uh, it'd be nice to cut back to uh, have a chat to both of you. So maybe if you could um, share your screen, Aaron, and we'll just have a. We can get you both on screen. But I think one of the questions, I think. There was a lot of discussion about this idea that your um, your individual um, contribution across Brisbane makes a similar impact to a large cultural um, cultural building. And Aaron, maybe just turn on your camera if you could. It's turned off at the moment. Um, so I, I kind of I'm interested in that as a way in which you can read your work collectively, and then in the broader sense, how do you how do you see your contribution um, to Brisbane collectively? How do you work as an office with other offices? Like, what what is the nature of that relationship in Brisbane? Brisbane seems to be an, a city where there is a lot of collaboration or a lot of kind of learning, I suppose, from each other. Um, I might kick it off, Aaron. Um, I, I think I'm um, coming back to your first question, Adam. Um, I think in the time back in the many years ago, in the early days of the practice, we were being kind of egocentric and um, we were kind of, I guess, we were working in a kind of way that we thought was critical, but we wanted to make sure that maybe this might have been recognised to a broader audience and. Uh, there was, you know, there always has been a lot of criticism that um, residential work for uh, privileged people is somehow not a relevant kind of practice of architecture. Um, and we had heard some criticism that was kind of along those lines. And so we were kind of searching for a way in which we were, we were able to articulate what we believed in was relevant work that we were doing. We, we really needed to make uh, feel like what we were doing every day you know, working many hours was somehow a kind of meaningful contribution to uh, the city, not just in, in the city's, not in the, fa not just in the fabric of the city, but also in, in the kind of culture of the city. Um, so we kind of, you know, was a, this sort of articulating this idea about um, yard by backyard or lot by lot, somehow we were actively engaged in city making was kind of a way to kind of settle, our, settle ourselves um, into a belief that kind of these little projects that we were doing that nobody could get access to and, and few people could see from the street actually did matter. And in a context such as a low density city like Brisbane, you kind of very quickly realised that if you don't take care of all of that remnant open space or that historic open space that we have, you pretty quickly squander it and, and ruin the character of a city like Brisbane. So. It all became very obvious to us that that was actually the case. You, um, oops. 
you... What was the second part of the question, Adam? Sorry, I, I just have to unmute. I just have to unmute myself. Apologies. Um, and I'm interested also in the way or, or, or how do Brisbane practices come together? Like what, you, what, what kind of networks exist within Brisbane that it feels like a lot, it feels like this is a collective idea that happens in Brisbane, that people understand their relationship, their, their, the need to act collectively in the way in which then they produce buildings to improve public domain or improve um, suburban sprawl in a way. Like how, how, how does that happen? Like is that, is that an active thing that people are kind of talking about or do you think that's just something that a number of our practice are doing and something that, that, that we can notice from afar? Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure, Aaron. Um, would you like to answer that or do you want me to kind of fumble my way through it? Um, I actually tuned out because I, I thought you were going to answer. I was just um, looking at myself in the webcam. Um, I, I, think, uh, I, I think I can scrap scratch together a, an answer though based on what I can recall um the I, I wonder I, I don't have a lot to compare it to to be honest and um I kind of wonder whether maybe that's a perception that exists uh for people outside of Brisbane and maybe less so for people who are in Brisbane I, I do know that particularly in West End where where we're located there is a really strong um cohort um and collegial atmosphere between a number of practices. So that's certainly true of um, one pocket of Brisbane. And, and look, we've been really fortunate that we've had great support from um, practices like Conrad Gargett and Urbis um, to, to do joint ventures with them. So the pro projects that we didn't talk about tonight, but we're engaged in, we've done a, a large vet hospital in Fiji with Conrad Gargett and a number of other projects um, that are sort of in the works. And uh, we're also working on a, a large, um, uh, Parkland um, with with Urbis at, at the moment as well. So, um, and we also um, collaborate regularly on and have done on a number of projects, including um, a new neighbourhood centre in New Farm and um, a library in uh, Nambucca Heads with Zazana and Nicholas, who are um, a small um, practice here in Brisbane um, as well. So, look, it, it, there's a lot of it happening, but I, I, to be honest, I don't really have a sense of how that differs from other parts of the country. So I guess you can kind of extrapolate from what I've said, whether or not you think that the shoe fits in Melbourne or Sydney or Wollongong or wherever it is that you, you might happen to be tonight. Um, Aaron muting. Um, so kind of building on from that a little bit, because I think it is uh, sometimes challenging when you're in a context to understand the way that, that people see it from outside. But I'm interested in this, I suppose what I see in your work is this level of beauty, delight and joy. There is an inherent quality of those three items, I think, beauty, delight and joy, and how that, how you're able to take that from small residential projects into the public works that, you, that I know that you're doing. How do you, how do you enable that to occur? How do you, because it's quite a different relationship between a house client to a civic client or a commercial client. How, how, what's your kind of strategies for, for dealing with that? Um, yeah, I, th I think um, I think Aaron and I have always um, been interested in ideas. Um, we're, we're certainly interested in making beautiful things, and um, beauty is often scorned by parts of society. But I think it's unavoidable when you're um, engaged in the act of making, uh, you know, an object or, or something that you move through, or making a piece of the city. But I think. Um, Really, the thing that um, preoccupies us is a, a, just a, an interest in ideas that we find fascinating, um, and ideas that have always been aligned with occupation um, and uh, you know human occupation of space and day to day um, day to day routines and rituals in um, in human culture. So, um, I mean, I'm not sure if Aaron and I would um, express it as an interest in uh, people, but I think in, in a way it has to be, you know, we kind of think that it's a preoccupation in, um, with buildings, but I think it's actually a, a, a deep interest in uh, human and uh, humans and uh, and cultural occupation, I guess, of cities. So I think when you kind of build your, your build your practice around an interest in ideas, uh, fundamentally those ideas can be scaled and um, 
our starting point is always to sit and listen to stories. And those stories can be about residential occupation, but they can also be about um, the way in which a business culture operates and how people uh, work together. And those stories are just as relevant, you know, from um, you know, from a commercial client to a residential client. Um, and we still find the kind of the tools of ideas and room making relevant from a small house extension through to a, a kind of large commercial building or a public building. Ultimately, all of these buildings are about people. So, oops, I just got to see whether I'm muted or not. Sorry, I was muted again. So, I'd kind of okay. extend that a bit further. I'm, I'm interested in your take on, let's say, just let's give us two architects who you, in contemporary Australian architecture, who you think, who you admire from a kind of, who you admire, like the, whose work you admire doesn't have to be necessarily in Brisbane, but I think contemporary Australian um, architects who you think are doing excellent work within a realm of the kind of values that you've placed around your work. Yeah, I think um, I think it's in a scale to, for any practicing architect in Brisbane, um, not acknowledge the importance of architects like Timothy Hill. Um, I think you know his um, the work that he has been making independently, but also um, in the practice of Donovan Hill has uh, has taught many of us really uh, fundamental lessons. I think and. Um, you know, I, I think his work was all was, was always very insightful about occupation, um, and and his ideas were scalable. So, at the start of the practice, we consciously tried to avoid uh, making work that took on the manner of our teachers, like Donovan Hill. But we'd learned so much from them, and we tried to kind of remake buildings that that took those lessons. Um, there's really important lessons, lessons about how you make an opening in a wall, for example, just something as simple as that. You know, Tim would make a statement like, you know, the most in, the most expensive thing you can do is put a hole in a wall. So you've got to make it count. And there would be a kind of three ways in which an opening might be articulated. So it was about kind of a simple, simple idea about making a hole in a wall that would, um, that might um, inform the elevation of a building. Um, so I think Timothy Hill's always present and I think that's the case for, for anyone practicing here. Um, Aaron, would you like to, to offer the second architect? Yeah, I thought you might do that once you'd taken Donovan Hill. Um, <clears throat> to be honest, it's, it's a little, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of a question that I can't really answer. I, I would also have gone immediately to, to Brian and Tim's work um, because I th think they've had such an immense impact on our city and I think um, despite how celebrated they are, I think they're not celebrated in enough. Um, their, their work is is really amazing and the ideas that sit behind it are really amazing and we, we very much modelled our practice on um, a lot of what they did um, and trying to learn from them, not, not so much um, we, we quite, quite deliberately set out to make work that didn't um, superficially resemble Donovan Hill's work because um, that felt like a trap that would have been really easy to fall into. Um, but behind the kind of the, the superficial appearance of our buildings, we were working really, really hard to understand um, what they were doing, how they were doing it, how they were able to create a culture that could make buildings um, that were that exceptional. Um, so, so I, I would, I would have to say that I definitely support um, Stu's um, submission. And to, beyond that, I, to be honest, there are there are probably half a dozen practices, and if I named one of them, then I'd, I'd probably feel bad. And a lot of them are friends, so um, I'll, uh, I might just, um, I might duck that one, Adam, if that's all right. <laughs> well, that's no problem. Muting that's no now. Problem um, I want to thank you both. Uh, we're kind of towards the end uh, of the time, but I want to thank you both for uh, sharing Thanks, the work Adam. with us tonight. 
a, a sensational work. Uh, really interesting to hear you talk about the nature of getting there, of the kind of process you go through and the thinking that you that you have to get to the end point. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, we hope you enjoy your isolation. Uh, we're looking forward to the next one of these talks, uh, yet to be announced, but it will be a Melbourne architect. Uh, we're kind of trying to take a first trip around, one trip around the country. Uh, so Melbourne and Tasmania and uh, WA, um, probably the ACT in South Australia at some point. Um, but uh, stay in touch. Uh, I'm sure that if anyone's got any questions, they could email um, Stuart and Aaron. But in the interim, you can email us at the Arctic Bookshop, hello at the Arctic Bookshop .com um, and we will help issue, uh, give you some information about um, folks and Peters. And if you are after one of these fantastic uh, items of their clothing line, which we will put up on the website, uh, we will give you the directions to that as well. Uh, but thank you very much, guys. We really appreciate it. And uh, thanks, Adam. Thanks a lot. Have a great, uh, have You're a great welcome. Day, so. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.